All right. Good morning, everybody. It's it's 11:01, so I'm going to uh, get started with the lesson. If if I had my screen sharing on, you were watching me test a few things and make sure that the uh, materials for today were going to work. But now that they've been tested and we're live on video, they're going to fail because that's just the way the world is. Um, so you've got 34 people logged in out of 49, which is not great, but that's not horrible. Um, certainly, a, certainly a quorum. 35! And let me turn off that annoying chime because uh, I don't want it anymore. There, now people can sneakily log in and I won't have to hear them. Uh, I'll turn on my screen sharing in a minute. And I uh, just want to welcome you all to uh, Lesson 6. I hope you've had a great week so far. And the sudden change in temperature was a blessing to you. You can see by how I'm dressed, my house is a little cold. Uh, I basically live in a tent with drywall walls. Um, so it, it goes ambient pretty quickly. And um, I don't want to turn on the heater just yet because it really affects my sinuses and I would be I would be dripping out of my head while having this uh, video which I guess the resolution of the camera is not that good but I think it'd be potentially quite ugly uh, <clears throat> all right without any further uh, morning grossness uh, let's let's begin so first let me turn on my screen sharing I have the recorder running I had a recorder fall in the class just before this one and I think I recovered from it, but uh, I don't completely trust it. So recorder's on, screen sharing's on, share the desktop, put all of our lovely faces down here in the corner. Actually, this is good. We don't have to see each other now, um, unless you want to. And I want the chat box. Where's that? Don't need that. There. Nice chat box over there on the right edge. And get as much real estate here in the web browser as I can. And we'll begin lesson six. Today's lesson is on pumping. Pumping. Pumping, yeah. Uh, moving water from low head to high head. And this should take us to the content server. Pump and system curves net positive suction head. A review of pump types, pump curves as supplied for centrifugal mixed and axial flow pumps, system pump curves for hydraulic networks, net positive suction head, pump power, online and spreadsheet tools. So that's uh, today's topic. That's actually a lot. The uh, video links um, th there's two, uh, videos from 2018. Uh, I've verified that they're active. I'll do that right now. And, uh, okay, that goes to a YouTube video. That one's about an hour long. And then part two of 2018 is 11 minutes long. So those are supplementary. And then as these become available, I'll uh, add the links. In the notes section, there's a section on pump selection. This isn't very long. It's uh, 18 or so pages out of a book. This would be good reading, especially if you're having trouble sleeping. Uh, there's also pump suction conditions. Same author, same book, in fact. And uh, we will discuss some of these issues that are out of this document today. Uh, net positive suction head from a operator's training book. So this is for um, uh, teaching system operators uh, some topics about uh, pumping and pumps. And uh, 
lift station design manual. So if none of this makes sense and you really have trouble sleeping, you can go here and read exactly how to define design a lift station. And it has all the uh, criteria. And then a similar manual for highway stormwater lift station design. So uh, that, that's today's uh, subject. So we'll start with uh, part one. Pumps and lift stations. So a pump is a mechanical device that transfers mechanical energy into a liquid. And they're used to lift water or liquid from lower to higher elevation. And those things are usually called lift stations. Um, or to increase pressure, and those are called booster stations. But the difference between the two is semantic only. They're doing the same thing. They're an assembly of pumps and pipes that are used to add energy. In the gas phase, the equivalent device is called a compressor. The photograph is a, a generic pump. In the past, if we were doing this class face-to-face, -face, and I played the actual PowerPoint, it has a nice animation. Um, because when this slide first comes up, it has a set of uh, seafoam green pumps for wearing with a party dress. So it's, it's really big. They're not quite stiletto heels, but um, uh, the, the ladies would, would know what I mean. Um, and it, it makes a nice sight gag in a face-to-face -face class. And, you know, ironically, I actually can argue it's doing the same thing. It's lifting from lower to higher elevation. It's not lifting water, it's lifting a human being, but since human beings are mostly water, I guess it, it's appropriate. But I didn't see how to play that video over the air and, um, and not offend anybody, so I just took it out. It, it's funny in person, but it wouldn't be funny on video. So here's our pump. Uh, there's a motor, and the motor drives the pump, which is right here where the cursor is circling. I'll go slowly to be sure that the five frame a second video can pick it up. And so this, this is actually called the pump housing. The pump is inside here. And inside is something that looks kind of like a propeller or a garbage disposal impeller blade. And it's called an impeller. And uh, it takes water coming in through the suction side it's spinning around fast, so it throws the water to the outer housing of the pump. And when the water has enough energy, it exits through this discharge uh, channel. So there's the suction. This is called the eye of the pump, where the water comes in. And uh, this is the discharge side of the pump. So this particular photograph is of largely a, a centrifugal pump. Um, and I, I, can, I know that by looking at it because the pump housing is comparatively thin and I have a very obvious right angle change of flow direction. Uh, other types of pumps are axial flow pumps and this photograph is an example of one. And the other uh, feature of this photograph is it demonstrates the scale that pumps can have. So that, that first one was probably the size of a couch. This one's clearly the size of a truck. So pumps can get quite large. Uh, this one's clearly not in service because you wouldn't have people working on it and then this gentleman over here providing supervision. And uh, they have some of the uh, stuff tied off so it it won't spin around while they're doing whatever maintenance they're doing. And then there's a housing that goes over this. You take the people out, put the housing on, and uh, the pump operates. And this is a pump that works. This is a hurricane lift station pump. So the water comes in here in this dark area, and uh, then it's, it's pushed out to the lower left corner of the screen. And pumps can be quite small. Here's some photographs of uh, some very small pumps. Um, this first one here 
judging from the way the input and the output look, this is a, a small, this is either a very small turbo pump, but I doubt it. It's probably a very small diaphragm pump. And then these ones are, are, are diaphragm pumps. And if you look at the uh, sides of it, there's a match head. So this is the kind of pump that's inside a medical device. Um, so it, it takes um, medicine from this side and squirts it into your body if you have a port in you. And then there, there's other applications than that. But the point is, I wanted to make with these two pictures is scale. Pumps can be extremely small and extremely large. The principle of operation, um, regardless, is, is the same. Uh, we're imparting energy to the liquid molecules, um, and that energy is used usually to move the liquid from one point to another. So there's two main different um, types of pumps, if you will. Uh, the first is a positive displacement pump, and the second type is a variable displacement pump. Let's talk about the positive displacement pump first. In a positive displacement pump, a, f a fixed or a known volume of fluid is displaced every cycle, regardless of the uh, system head or pressure. So returning to um, these small pumps here, uh, especially this one that's disassembled. So uh, this is a diaphragm pump. It looks like it's a two-stage. So there's a little cavity in here, and when electricity is applied, the diaphragm moves away from the cavity, and it creates a it creates room for the liquid to come and fill the cavity. And then when the uh, current is reversed on that side. The diaphragm pushes that cavity closed, kind of like a piston. So let's say for the sake of argument that cavity holds one milliliter of liquid. Every time the pump cycles, it pushes one milliliter of liquid through it. So it doesn't matter if it's pushing it out to the air or if it's pushing it into a blood vessel in order to deliver a, a therapeutic dose of some substance. It's one milliliter per cycle. On these uh, larger pumps, uh, this one in particular, the, the amount of discharge it produces is dependent not only on the size of everything, but on the head of the water on the suction side and the head of the water that it's pushing into. And if those head differences get large, for a constant RPM, this pump doesn't push as much water per time unit, and its, its displacement is variable, and its displacement is dependent upon the surrounding hydraulic conditions. The, um, as a generalization, the fixed displacement pumps have lower flow rates for a given physical size than variable displacement, but they can push into much higher head than a variable displacement. So if there's a need to uh, push liquid against very high heads, uh, like trying to uh, force it into a uh, <clears throat> circulatory system of a body, the heads aren't that high, but you need to be sure that you get your medicine pushed into the body every cycle of the pump. Uh, that's a better choice. Variable displacement pumps are the opposite. Uh, uh, the volume of fluid displaced depends on the uh, st static pressures of different parts of the system. In the fixed displacement pump world, there's uh, uh, quite a few different types, and a couple of them are listed here. One is a screw pump, and we've seen photographs of that already in earlier lessons. Uh, the other one is a reciprocating pump, and uh, we'll see some examples of that shortly. And then in the variable displacement world, the uh, classifications are fewer. There's uh, centrifugal or radial flow pumps, uh, uh, axial flow or propeller pumps, and 
jet pumps, which is a mixed flow um, type of pump. And jet pumps themselves are comprised of either a centrifugal or propeller pump. I'll try to allude to that when we get to it. So first let's look at a screw pump. So here's a photograph of one in service. And so this thing's uh, rotating around its merry way. Down here at the, uh, at the sump, uh, liquid uh, is ponded. And each of these screw flights catches a piece of liquid and slowly pushes it up the incline. Um, here's a drawing of one. And the usual layout is there's a motor at the top, there's a bearing at the bottom, and we have this uh, set of screws laying in a trough, as is depicted in this picture. The other way to build these is to have a pipe, and you put the uh, screw flights inside the pipe. But same basic principle. The advantage of screw flights inside the pipe is you don't need a trough. And the uh, liquid is lifted up, and then it discharges to its uh, uh, new elevation. So these, these pumps have um, some interesting utility or advantages, if you will. One of their advantages, one of the disadvantages is they're not exactly small. These require uh, quite a bit of space. Um, one of the other disadvantages is this bottom bearing. If the liquid is somewhat corrosive, such as sewage, um, you take a community of a few hundred thousand people and you run food and water through their colons and their kidneys. What comes out the other side is pretty harsh on things like steel and um, other ferrous metals. And so this bottom bearing either has to be organized in such a way that it doesn't become submerged with the corrosive material or be manufactured out of relatively exotic materials, perhaps a manel or some other alloy that can withstand the corrosion. So, you know, that aside, screw pumps is really good for sewage because if you get the occasional um, turtle or um, someone is successful at flushing a stuffed animal down the toilet and it gets to the uh, treatment plant, a screw pump will easily lift a stuffed animal without clogging. Uh, that that's the advantages of it. Uh, the other advantage of it is the flow rate is dependent entirely on RPMs, however this motor is, and whatever the uh, the pool depth is here. So these are very forgiving um, pumping systems, but they're but they're big and uh, aren't used as much as they used to be. And it's not because better things have come along, it's it's just a, a mindset. Uh, example of a positive displacement pump, here's something called a progressive cavity pump. And if you look at that photograph, and we look at this photograph, there's a whole lot of similarity between the two. It has a set of flights, if you will. In this case, this uh, wobbly shaped rotor, which is uh, what rotates, and then the, the trough is also wobbly shaped. In the case of a this type of pump, the trough is called the stator. It stays put. Stator. Stay there. Don't move. And as this uh, rotates through, these cavities uh, change size, and material is pushed from one cavity to the next, and it's always pushed at a constant volume per rotation. So progressive cavity pumps are used a lot in the petroleum industry and certain uh, chemical industries where the material being pumped uh, would be what we call thick. Uh, so the material has pretty high viscosity and probably high density, and these work really good for that. Another type of positive displacement pump is a piston pump. And you uh, may have seen these. Uh, you may have a version of one that you use to uh, put air back in your automobile tires. You plug one in into the cigarette lighter in the car, and you plug the other one into the low tire, and then you flip the switch, and it makes this terrifyingly loud noise. And after about an hour, the tire has air in it. 
Uh, that's a compressor. It's not exactly a pump, but it's a piston type device. So this piston moves up and down, and in doing so, this cavity gets big and then small again, and there's a series of check valves to allow flow to occur in one direction. So when this piston is raised up, this check valve is pulled down into its seat so there's no backflow, and this check valve is lifted up so that material can come in and fill the space, and then when the piston pushes down, this check valve is pushed down into its seat, this one's lifted up, and the material goes on along its merry way. To the right is a, a simple single cylinder piston pump that you may be familiar with um, uh, from your own uh, house or apartment, depending on how good the plumbing is. Um, this is a six speed, so this is for pushing log jammers through a toilet. And uh, it's the simplest piston pump there is. You, you place it into the material to be moved, and you press hard and you change the cavity size from big to little, and it pushes the, uh, the material hopefully over the siphon and restarts uh, the toilet. And this one being a six speed, if you have to do it a couple times, you can shift gears and, and get more flow. That again is a funny sight gag in face to face, a little less so on video. The variable displacement pump series or rotational machines uh, work on a similar principle in that they are displacing fixed volumes of water. Uh, the volumes they're dealing with are much smaller, it just does it much uh, faster. So the radial flow pump is depicted by this top drawing. And in a radial flow pump, liquid comes into the center of the pump, and the center is called the eye. And uh, as this impeller spins around, the flow is radial outward away from the center. And there's a housing that catches all this flow and directs it to the discharge side. <clears throat> and the uh, key things about the radial flow is that the axis of rotation is corresponds to the inflow axis <coughs> and the axis of flow is radially outward at the edge of the impeller. The other kind of pump is an axial flow pump or a propeller pump and it's exactly what it sounds like. There's a impeller spinning around that behaves as an impeller and the water coming to the pump blades and leaving the pump blades stays in the same direction. Uh, that's an axial flow pump. A gas phase example of an axial flow pump that I imagine everybody listening to me now has experienced is, is when you get on an airplane, uh, those high bypass turfo fans are indeed axial flow pumps. And so what they do is they pump air really fast and that's what makes the plane fly. Uh, that and the magic, but mostly the uh, Turbo, the turbo, uh, turbo fan engine. And then there's a uh, compromise system called a mixed flow pump. And in these cases, the impellers don't totally uh, produce centrifugal flow. It actually comes in at one direction, leaves at an angle. And then there's a set of stator blades that are not depicted here in the picture that redirect the flow to the next one of these. And these impellers are built in stacks or multiple stages. It could be 10 or 15 of them. Um, these are real common in submerged, submersible pumps. And the advantage of this is you can, we can get uh, pretty good flow rates in small diameters. Uh, these axial flow pumps here, the diameters are, are measured in feet. And the centrifugal flow pumps, the diameters are measured uh, for, for industrial size are in feet. And these ones down here, the diameters can be down in inches, a little bit more reasonable. Cat, this is not a good time to get cuddly. But I don't get to choose that, do I? So if we look at a centrifugal pump, um, here's a couple of YouTube videos, and I'm going to uh, actually attempt to run one of them. Let me see if I can remember the right one. These 
these are actually pretty good videos um, to explain the principle of pumps. So let's give one a shot. The other video is uh, shows a type of positive displacement pump. It's not an animation. It's a real video. Um, let me take the time. Yeah, we can take the time to look at that for. And uh, the uh, rest of that video is just more explanation of that uh, impeller pump. The second pump is a type of a positive displacement pump. So these two videos give you a, a feeling of the uh, two different uh, types. So returning to my presentation, in the uh, diagrams at the bottom of this uh, slide are our, our sketches of uh, a couple of centrifugal pumps. Um, namely, these are to show what's meant by the suction eye, which is where the uh, liquid comes in, and the discharge fitting. And here there's the electrical part and what they said in the video, the uh, cantilever supported uh, bearing to hold this impeller in place. And so the water can go squirting on its very merry way. And then this right image is a view looking down the axis through the impeller eye. And so what you would see, if you could, would be the impeller vanes, which were described in the video, and the housing, which uh, has, it looks circular, but it's not. It's actually an increasing radius turn. So the distance from the center line to this edge and the distance from the center line to the right edge are different, larger to the right edge in this drawing. And so the, the radius is getting um, bigger as it works around, and that's what allows the accelerated water a way to get out to the discharge pipe. Axial flow pumps are the propeller pumps. And um, here's a drawing from uh, online Encyclopedia Britannica showing the fluid coming in, getting accelerated and making its way out. And here's a photograph of a axial flow pump during installation over at um, east side of Lubbock at the uh, East Loop Lab that uh, civil engineering uh, operates. Um, this is a really nice picture of it. Actually, the lab is clean in this picture. It doesn't look quite that organized right now. Um, but to give you an idea of, of size, I'm six feet tall, and if I go down into this pump pit, I can barely reach this upper edge. So that, that's how big these pumps are. Uh, moving on, the uh, second part is, um, that was our introduction to pumps and just a brief overview. Um, entire careers can be made with pumps. If you think pumps are cool, there's certainly not a lot of jobs in pumps, but there's some, and um, it's, it's going to be a healthy career field 
for a long, long time, as long as there's uh, people around. Um, when we select pumps for a water system, uh, we have a few decisions to make to help pick a particular pump. Um, we have to specify the design conditions. Uh, we did that last meeting with the Africa pipeline example. Um, and in that particular one, uh, a lot of the design conditions were prescribed. Our question was, you know, was the pump going to be able to perform at the most expected uh, type of failure, which I surmised was the valve accidentally being left open. And we ultimately concluded that that particular pump would be fine in that situation. It would not be able to handle a pipeline failure, nor would it be able to handle the float valve failure. But the most likely failure, which is the valve being left open, it was more than adequate. Um, once the design conditions are specified, we want to select a pump uh, for the anticipated range of application. And by that, we mean uh, a pump doesn't always operate at its design point. We also have to ask the question, what if the required pumping demand is more than we designed for? What if it's less? Um, if it's less, that's usually not an issue. If it's, if it's more, it could be. Uh, we don't want our designs to be so tightly specified that if the design flow rate is exceeded by a few percent, the system fails. We want it to be able to accommodate that um, for short periods of time. And then we would prepare a system curve. And what that represents is the total head loss in the distribution system as a function of discharge. And it's the amount of head that the pump would have to provide for a particular discharge in the distribution system. Um, and we'll try to illustrate that by example. I uh, usually at first introduction, it's a little confusing. For complicated systems, uh, we actually would use a computer program not to generate a system curve, but instead what we would do is put various pump curves into the computer program, let it simulate behavior, and see if that pump can satisfy the network requirements. A, a network of 5,000 nodes and 6,200 pipes uh, with demands changing every hour over a 24-hour cycle would be, um, that would be out of the question to, to draw a hand-drawn system curve. I, I suppose you could do it, but it would be uh, unnecessary work. But that would be quite simple to uh, model in a network simulator model and then uh, test our pumps in that case. The system curve is then matched to a pump curve. The pump curve is the performance supplied by the manufacturer. And in last, uh, last time's lesson, uh, we didn't have an explicit pump curve, not that it was plotted, but we looked at the pump performance table for that particular Krylosar 1537 or whatever the pump model was, and it had a row of flow rates for different operating heads. That is the pump curve. So that gives us the pump performance under different flow rates and the different kinds of heads that it can produce. And then we want to match the two. And the matching point is called the operating point, And that's where the pump would be expected to operate for the given system conditions. So the system curve is simply, conceptually, it's a plot of the required head versus flow rate in a hydraulic system. Uh, the curve depicts how much energy is necessary to maintain a steady flow under the supplied conditions. And the um, total head uh, for the system would be any elevation head plus head losses. And this picture is a diagram of a system curve for some hydraulic system. And what it's depicting is these, these three different flow rates, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, units are not specified, requ 
for that system to operate at those flow rates, that system has to have flow coming to it at the following values of total head. 32 units of head, 35 units of head, 41 units of head at those three flow rates. Um, again here, units not specified. When we get down to a point of zero flow rate, there is a value of head that has to be supplied. Otherwise, flow direction changes and the system starts to empty. That is called the shutoff head for the system. Um, what that means is that uh, we have to provide 30 units of head for the system just to stay put at zero flow rate. A, a mental way to picture that, imagine, imagine you have a pipe, long, long pipe, um, a couple feet in diameter, so big enough to fit inside, and you mount it on the ground and it's pointed straight up into the air. So at the bottom, uh, it's cemented into the ground, and at the top, the pipe is open to the air. And then we put a fitting into it so we can put water into this tall pipe. And so let's suppose we put, uh, we put one meter of water into the pipe through this fitting, and then we uh, turn off the supply, pull everything apart, and then open up the valve at the uh, bottom. What's going to happen? Well, that one meter of water is going to leak back out. The only way to keep that one meter of water in it is either to close the valve or put a pump onto it that can deliver one meter of head at zero flow rate. So this, this pump is running its little heart out. It's not filling anything up. It's just keeping that meter of water in it. A similar analogy could be thought of of an automatic transmission on an automobile. If you go to a hilly city like San Francisco, um, you can be at a stop sign on one of the steeper hills with an automatic transmission and you, and you let off the brake and the car just stays put. It doesn't go uphill and hopefully it doesn't slide back downhill. That engine's still running and the uh, automobile is using up energy just to stay in place. That, that is shutoff head. Uh, if you were to shut the engine off on the car and leave it in gear, even with automatic transmission, it would start to roll backward. So we have to have energy supplied to the system just to keep things at zero. Uh, so that's what this zero point is. So pumps have shut off heads too. It's the amount of head or how high it can pump water and hold it there, uh, but there's no net flow rate. So let's examine this uh, very uh, skeletonized hydraulic system and come up with its system curves. So suppose we have two reservoirs, reservoir one and reservoir two, and they're connected by a pump and pipe system. And so from reservoir one, we take water from the bottom of the reservoir, pass it through a pump, and then we connect to reservoir two, and we're actually connecting to its bottom. So just as an aside, this is a pretty poor hydraulic design because if this pump ever fails, the water from reservoir two is going to just come back and spill out in reservoir one. Uh, better would be to have a one-way check valve or to actually drop into the top and air gap it. Okay, that's an aside. So here's our system. We're told the friction factor is 0.015 and it's a thousand meter, 40, thousand meter long, 40 centimeter pipe. So, so that's our, our very simple skeletonized system. So if we were to write the energy equation from 1 to 2, what we would have is the total head at location 1 um, plus the added head of the pump equals the total head at location 2 plus the friction loss along the way. And in the friction loss, we would take this entrance loss this exit loss, this bend loss, and the pipe loss. We could rearrange that equation for the added head of the pump equals the total head at reservoir 1 uh, minus the total head at reservoir 2 plus the uh, head loss. And in doing that, here's what's left. We have 30 meters, which is the 
uh, difference between the heads of the two reservoirs. So the pump has to provide 30 meters to lift the water from 200 to 230. It also has to provide energy to overcome these frictional losses. And that frictional loss changes with flow rate Q. If we perform the indicated arithmetic in this uh, expression, we come up with the pump, the added head of the pump is equal to 127Q squared plus 30. So the drawing here, if we just want to keep the two reservoirs as shown, with Q equal to zero, that pump has to generate 30 meters of head. If we want to move Q at one meter cubed per second, it has to generate 157 meters of head. And then the plot of all those uh, different flow rates, required heads, is called the system curve. And the relationship tells us that the added head has to be at least 30 meters just to keep the reservoirs at the two levels shown. If any flows to occur, the pump has to supply more than 30 meters of head. So that, that's the system curve. Now the pump curves are supplied by manufacturers. And in the olden days, that information was actually delivered in the form of a curve. Now it's done in a tabular form. Um, or usually they just take your credit card number and $60,000. Yeah, we'll make it work. Um, it, the uh, the Fly-By-Night Pump Corporation can pretty much provide a pump for any situation. So the information that's included on a manufacturer's curve is discharge, total head, pump power, pump efficiency, the speed of the pump that was used to make the curve, and then the net positive suction head required for the pump. Um, and here is a picture of a pump curve for a uh, pump curve from the Southern Cross Corporation, which I imagine is um, down in the Australia world. Uh, this is this one's dated May 2005, so it's not that old. That's only a 15-year-old picture, and th this illustrates what a typical manufacturer's pump curve looks like. Now, most real manufacturers' pumps, you can get curves like these. They don't often appear in the online product literature because um, that's just not how, how, they're, how they're marketed. In marketing, we only get a few operating points or a table like we saw last time. But that table actually contains most of the information of a pump curve. So this particular one is telling us that the pump is normally operated at 2,945 revolutions per minute. The inlet diameter, so the, uh, the pump eye, has a fitting to accept 125 mill millimeter uh, pipe. And then this discharges into an 80 millimeter outlet pipe. And uh, this particular pump uses the number two shaft module um, that's important because what changes in most commercial pumps is there's only a handful of housings and shaft modules and they change the impeller diameter to meet different operating conditions. So here's a set of curves with the impeller diameter labeled. So in shaft number in the number two shaft module you can fit anything from a 182 millimeter diameter impeller up to a 228 <clears throat> millimeter diameter impeller. And the curves associated with each of those impeller sizes are the pump performance curve. So let's uh, focus on the 182 millimeter diameter impeller. And on the left axis, we have total head in meters. And on the bottom axis, we have flow rate. And so with the 182 millimeter impeller, if we operated it at 30 liters per second, that pump should produce 40 meters of, of head. And so that might be um, 
Oh, that would have totally fit our Africa pipeline problem for all the uh, failure modes. So we, we could have gotten a pipe uh, pump for that. And then if the uh, flow rate is increased, the amount of head the pump can produce goes down. So at a flow rate of 60 liters per second, twice what we had before, the best we can hope for that pump is only 18 meters of head. So we turn to the 30. If we were to increase the impeller diameter from 182 to 228, and that's not something you can do automatically. They don't have a little uh, app for that. You actually have to tear it apart and put a new impeller in. Um, with a 228 millimeter impeller, we can get almost 70 meters ahead out of that same pump housing. So our specification variables include impeller diameter, um, to some extent the uh, flow rate. The other um, curves here, these ones uh, that are labeled with a percentile, those are our operating efficiencies, uh, wire to water efficiency. So the sweet spot for this pump is uh, somewhere over in this range. Um, using the large impeller, we can get almost a 77, nearly 80% efficiency if we're operating up here at 50 liters per second, a little bit more than 60 meters of head. And the efficiency drops off as we decrease the impeller size, which makes sense because there's a lot of the housing that's no longer being used. And down here with our smallest impeller, our efficiency sweet spot is probably somewhere in here, around 40 liters per second, <coughs> with an efficiency of 71 or 72 percent. So every Every horsepower that goes into the machine, seven-tenths of a horsepower gets transferred to the water. That's what this is telling us. And then there's another set of dashed lines here that's uh, telling us the power requirements under those different conditions. So the power requirement for this 40 liters per second with a small impeller is somewhere between 18 and a half and 22 kilowatts. And so if we don't have that power available, we can't make that work. The last thing I want to point out is this curve down here, there's a pair of them, and it has the net positive suction head required. So we'll see what net positive suction head is shortly, but this is giving us the conditions where the pump, what the pump needs on the suction side to actually work. And if this amount of suction head is not available, the pump will cavitate and fail. So that's what's contained in a pump curve. And here's a uh, diagram that's supposed to show how they get used. The green dot in this figure is in the wrong place. The green dot should be up here at the intersection. But if we look at this uh, picture, let's suppose we have a system curve is shown. So that's the darker face line here. We've calculated that uh, for the system just like we showed earlier. And we found two pumps, pump A and pump B. Pump A has the pump curve shown here, and pump B also has a pump curve. We plotted them both on the same axis as the system curve. What we can conclude from that plotting is that Pump A cannot meet the needs of the system at any flow rate. So a single pump A is of no use to us. Pump B supplies enough head over the shaded part of the system. So pump B will conceivably operate anywhere from this intersection back towards zero flow rate. Uh, when we're back here at the low flow rates, pump B is producing quite a bit of excess head. But once we go beyond this point, Pump B doesn't produce enough head. So this green dot is supposed to be at the intersection. And the shaded area represents the location where the pump provides excess head. Here's another uh, picture depicting the same kind of thing. System curve in green. Pump performance curve in red. Intersection is the operating point. 
In this case, at the operating point, we get 9 meters cubed an hour at 58 meters of head. Uh, there's an efficiency curve shown here. The efficiency at the operating point is 75%. That's actually pretty good. Uh, and then there's a net positive suction head. And at that um, operating point, this pump needs 4 meters of net positive suction head to operate successfully. We saw last time that if we put two pumps in series, we were able to hit the uh, Africa pipeline requirements. Um, we also can put pumps in parallels. If we put a pump in series, they add head for a given flow rate. Parallel pumps add flow for a given head. So we could build a system like this, two pump A's, one pump B, and some various uh, control valves and a throttle valve, and then head that off to our, uh, our system. Uh, as, to, as drawn here, it seems really simple. In, in actual practice, there's a bit of an art to uh, matching pumps of different sizes from different manufacturers to make something like this work without wasting energy, without having the pumps fight one another. But for the uh, purposes of learning, this is fine. We can um, combine pumps to achieve um, the equivalent of a much bigger unavailable pump. So here's an example of pumps in parallel. So the first pump produces that much discharge. The second pump produces that much discharge and they're added together. The third pump produces that much discharge again at a fixed head and they're added together and so the overall pump curve is this outer envelope. So three pumps in series would perform this outer envelope behavior. Excuse me, three pumps in parallel perform the outer envelope behavior. When we combine pumps in series, we have the uh, single pump, then we have the next single pump, and they're added vertically. And so the outer envelope in this case is the three pumps in series performance, and we can get the, uh, the heads to increase that way. And that's what we did with the Africa Pipeline example last time. Now this picture depicts that they that they add integrally here, so 2H1, 3H1. That's, that's not true on a real system. You lose a little bit with each pump, but from a design standpoint, uh, this, is, this is good enough. So in a real system, this might be 2.7H1, not, not, not actually a 3. And that's because there are uh, there, there are losses and there's, a, there's tuning requirements to get pumps in series to work well together. And, and that's just not, it's not trial and error and it's not art, but it's a little bit beyond um, ordinary design uh, consideration. And let's uh, discuss the suction requirements because the leading cause of failure of pumping systems is usually the suction conditions go south. Cavitation we've seen occurs when the liquid pressure is reduced to the vapor pressure of the liquid. Little bubbles form at the impeller and then the bubbles collapse and that, re that releases enough energy to actually take pieces of the impeller out of the impeller so it causes holes in the metal and over time it will um, it will destroy the pump system and if, if the cavitation is really severe if the liquid pressure goes way below the vapor pressure of the liquid for a long time it actually introduces a, a vapor bubble and the pump no longer pumps anything so for a piping system with a pump uh, we have cavitation occurs when the absolute pressure of the inflow falls below the vapor pressure of water. And that we can all look up and uh, use that to determine uh, the suction side requirements.
The uh, main requirement we have is that liquid must enter the pump eye under positive pressure. And that pressure is called the net positive suction head available, NPSHA. A centrifugal pump has the added bonus feature that it can't lift water unless, unless it's primed. In the videos, we saw the uh, pump lifting the green dishwasher detergent out of the beaker, and that seems to contradict my statement, but that was not a centrifugal pump. That was a positive displacement pump. And even that pump would have limitations to how high it can lift that uh, dishwater, that dishwashing soap. Uh, I would guess probably a, uh, at best 10 meters. Um, so generally the first stage in pellers have to be located below the static hydraulic grade line in the suction pit at startup. That doesn't mean a centrifugal pump has to be submerged in water, although that's usually a good idea. It means that the um, suction side piping has to be full of water when we turn the pump on. That's called priming. And uh, once it's primed, as long as the uh, static hydraulic grade line is such that the uh, pump at startup will have positive pressure, it'll work. So the suction requirements are supplied by the manufacturer. They provide a value for the minimum pressure the pump needs to operate, and that pressure is called the net positive suction head required. Uh, we saw that on the two pump curves already. For proper operation, the following inequality should be satisfied. The net positive suction head available should be greater than the net positive suction head required. And the next question is, how do we uh, calculate the net positive suction head available? It's actually quite straightforward. Uh, the formulas look something like this. So this one states that the net positive suction head available is equal to the absolute pressure at the liquid surface in the suction pit expressed in feet of head, the static elevation of the liquid above the pump inlet eye. So this above in red is underlined. Uh, the other way the equation is stated is the uh, static elevation of the inlet above the liquid. In that case, this plus becomes a minus sign. The frictional head loss <coughs> in the inlet piping expressed in feet ahead. And the absolute vapor pressure at liquid pumping temperature also expressed in feet ahead. So the vapor pressure we're going to look up in a table of material properties. Uh, the absolute pressure uh, we would um, look up or compute based on the elevation uh, of the water surface. So at sea level, the pressure will be one atmosphere. Uh, we go up uh, to Denver and the pressure is 0.9 atmospheres. I mean, and then that, that's what this uh, term is. This is a direct measurement. And then the frictional head loss is um, <clears throat> very much like a uh, ordinary head loss calculation. A Darcy Weisbach type formula applied to the uh, inlet piping side. Let's just work an example. So we're gonna this example. I'll, I'll present it. It's, it's all worked by hand. We'll do it again on the um, on the um, toolbox server. So a three thousand gallon per minute vertical turbine is located four thousand feet above angry sea level. Water temperature is ninety degrees Fahrenheit. The suction bell is a 24 inch diameter reducing to 12 inch diameter impeller uh, uh, reducer. The water level is never less than eight feet above the first impeller. That's a key bit of information. What's the net positive suction head available under the worst conditions? So first we want to determine the absolute pressure in the suction pit. Um, so we would look at the uh, air pressure in feet of water. 
First thing is at 4,000 feet above mean sea level, we need to adjust for the elevation change. So uh, air pressure changes at a rate of about a half a pound per square inch per thousand feet of elevation, a dry air change. Thus, the absolute uh, value of head is 33.9. That's the uh, pressure at sea level times 12.7 divided by 14.7. That's an adjustment for the elevation for the 4,000 feet times 0.85 that's an adjustment for a air pressure reduction when a thunderstorm comes above our pumping station uh, for a total of 24.8 feet. So this results the product of one atmosphere and feet of water adjusted for 4,000 foot elevation and adjusted again for a thunderstorm which typically occurs at 85% of normal atmospheric pressure. So this is a worst case estimate for absolute head, 24.8 feet. Um, then we want to determine, oh, this is the uh, same thing. <clears throat> so if we go to our online calculator, we have 24.8 would be our absolute uh, pressure that we'll enter into that. The next part is uh, the static head. This value is given. We're told water level is always 8 feet above. So we put the static pressure. So this uh, static above is an 8. Use negative head if the water is above the pump eye. <clears throat> then we have the head loss in the system. Um, in this case, it's not very much. We have the frictional loss, <clears throat> mostly due to the uh, suction bell reducer of 0.112 feet. And that's using the minor, minor loss coefficient of 0.1, using the 3,000 gallons per minute and the reduced diameter of one foot. Velocity is around 8.5 feet a second. Put that into this equation, come up with 0.112 feet. And then lastly, uh, we look up the vapor pressure in a table of water properties, and so that we get <clears throat> from our same tool. I hope it keeps the conditions. See, this was 90 degree water. 100 is pretty close. Um, vapor pressure is 0 0.949. And so we use uh, the 100 degree and the 80 degree to come up with their average. And so we have 1.67 feet. I have to redo all that. It didn't remember. 24.88.112. So that's everything we need to um, get a net positive suction head available. Hit the submit. It says there's uh, 15 feet. I have a mistake somewhere. Ah. So I even misread my own instructions. 
static elevation in the inlet eye above the liquid, we are told the liquid is already eight feet above the impeller. So if we redo that, we get the correct 31 feet of suction head. Um, and if we were to use a 10% as a margin of uncertainty, we would, we would specify that the pump doesn't require greater than 28 feet of net positive suction head. That is, if the pump has a net positive suction head required bigger than 28 feet on its pump curve, we have a potential pumping problem. And either a different pump should be used or the suction conditions changed. And there's the whole uh, example um, done there. So the, the net positive suction head computers online, this is, in my personal opinion, I, I did that because I always had trouble remembering the equation. This, this is not the kind of thing that you do every single day, but every engineer is expected to know how to do it. So you would have to look it up when you would need to do it. Uh, fortunately, you only need to do it when you're sizing pumps or taking a class like this one. Um, before we uh, conclude, because I believe that's it for this lesson, yep, is another thing that's important is be able to determine the uh, pump power quickly. So uh, pumping power is actually an easy formula to remember. It's... Um, Discharge times the, the specific weight of the liquid times the added head divided by the mechanical efficiency. So let's go back to the one we just uh, did, which was uh, 3,000 gallons a minute, um, and we want to convert gallons into cubic feet. Hope our converter works. Do I have volume? Acres, distance, pressure, rats. I don't have I don't have volume. Oh well. So oh but I do have the internet, don't I? So we had 3,000 gallons per minute with our pump. So it's 401 cubic feet per minute. Then we need to convert that into per second. So I think I have a gonculator here. 401 per minute. And there are 60 seconds in a minute. So 6.7 cubic feet per second. And let's say our pump is going to add 100 feet of head total. And it's a very efficient pump at 75% efficiency. I'm going to find out if it actually uh, converts for me. And the specific gravity of water is 62.4. Um... Yeah, that efficiency, the efficiency is in percent. There we go. So 3,000 gallons per minute requires um, to, to lift it 100 feet at 75% efficiency takes 6,000 horsepower. At 100% efficiency takes 4,000 horsepower. Um, so that's not a that's not a trivial amount of water, and the power requirement changes with the added head. So if we need to 
at 3,200 feet. So let's suppose we want to produce 3,000 gallons a minute and push it up hill 3,200 feet plus friction and everything. Um, what would be the power requirement? Be 151,000 horsepower or a bunch of watts. And if you visited one of the uh, uh, websites from the uh, first lesson, on large water system, um, the Central Valley Project in California, which I think was one of the links, you'll discover that uh, in building the lift to take the water up to the Hatchapi Mountains and deliver it to the Los Angeles Basin, there were two power plants built exclusively to provide electricity for the pumping station. No one else. They didn't send any to the uh, to the gambling casinos, or um, to lighting up cities or lighting up highways. It was strictly to lift water uphill. So moving water is uh, is a big deal, and uses a fair amount of power. So all these uh, online things uh, are easily replicable in a hand calculator, and they're just provided here. You can use them as a way to check work. That's that's the usual intent. And let's, um, oh, well, 11 o'clock. Well, so I got like less than a minute to go. What I wanted to check was um, upcoming exercises. And of course, it won't let me go there because this is. So our next um, upcoming exercise is. Lesson three, demand estimation. I think we've discussed this before, but it's simply to first uh, determine the demands that will be required by these individual nodes using these different definitions. You'll find it useful when you're doing this. Um, you might want to actually determine a good estimate for the elevations of each of these nodes. It's not required in the exercise, but it'll be quite a bit handy when we put this into a computer program. Uh, the other thing that will be handy is the length length in feet of each of these pipes. And that can be uh, determined the same way as you got the XY coordinates for the contour map, or you can simply measure the lengths directly with a ruler and then convert them into feet on the ground with this particular scale value right there. Okay, well, uh, thank you for your attention. I expected this to go quicker, um, but that was about right on time. And um, before I terminate the call, I will ask for any questions. And if there aren't any questions, uh, have a great afternoon. Have a good weekend, everybody, and be safe. And all the usual stuff that all your professors are saying be safe for your mask, don't get sick, and so forth. And, and don't don't laugh at that or start to ignore it. I mean, even though I'm I'm belittling it right now with my tone of voice, uh, it, it's actually quite serious. Um, it it both preserves my job and your health. So uh, please uh, do your best to stay safe. And with that, I will sign off. Uh, Marche, I I got your email the other day. And I've been trying to program the Zoom thing to do repeat um, Tuesday morning uh, Zoom meetings, and it hasn't been working for me. Uh, so to all of you, don't be surprised if at some time you get an um, email message inviting you to a recurring Zoom meeting. You're supposed to as soon as I can get the Zoom program to work. I find it funny. It's working for all my other classes. It just you guys are... Uh, are picked out against it. So again, have a good afternoon, everyone, and I will see you next week. Bye-bye.